Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at mommy. Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. Ooh. Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. You turn on the television or you pick up a newspaper magazine and all the information you see is just controlled by a, a handful of corporations. So how are you or I or any of us? How can we get our messages out to people? How can you tell people what you care about? You can go on Facebook and compete with uh, hundreds of people who post things that may or may or may not be true. You can go on Twitter and post things in a, with a handful of characters because Twitter is really the place for literate people to hang out. Or you could go in with a sandwich board and walk the streets. You could write a letter to the editor. Or even better, you could go to public access television. Public access serves your community on a first come first serve basis. And whether you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. It's first come, first served. Everyone in the community is welcome to come to public access and talk about not only the issues that are important to them, but if you have a, a poem to recite, a story to tell, a song to sing, just anything at all that's in your mind or a heart to tell, you come to public access. Public access in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm speaking right now, has been around since 1980, and I've seen it change events in Fayetteville. And uh, the nice thing about public access now in the 21st century is that it's not just on a television channel, but it's also on the Internet, so you can reach people around the world. So if you're just, if you feel frustrated at not being able to talk to people, not being able to get your message out, and you think there's no way to do it, well, take heart, there is. Public access, it's a vital component of our First Amendment rights. So public access, like the man says, use it or lose it. Hello, I'm Dan Robinson, Executive Director of Your Media. I'm Public Access Television, and so are you. Hi, with us today is Peter Tooker. Peter doesn't know it, but we're going to have him bronze before he leaves the building today. Uh, Peter's been around Fayetteville for a long time. Peter, you were um, one of the early editors of Grapevine, an alternative newspaper in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. You were uh, one of the organizers of Acorn many, many years ago. And you were on the original board directors of Fayetteville Open Channel. That's correct. So we have what, we have what physicists call oodles and gobs of things to talk about today. So... I guess one of the first things I guess we'll talk about is um, Grapevine mm -hmm. and your experience with that. I'll, uh, Grapevine's been out, out of print since 1993, so we have a transient community in Fayetteville. A lot of people come and go. So I guess we should talk about what Grapevine was for a lot of people in the audience who may not know what it was. All right. The Grapevine was an alternative free weekly newspaper, also known as an underground newspaper. And for much of my tenure, which was March of 78 until April of 84, we were about the only alternative newspaper in the state. And the grapevine was read by uh, all the, the local people in Fayetteville, and it was subscribed to by uh, Bill Clinton and Little Rock. Every once in a while, we would get a note from the governor's office asking us for a copy of a particular issue. And Was that uh, when he was governor? Yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. And the grapevine was uh, one of the only progressive voices here in Northwest Arkansas, and along with the Arkansas Gazette at the time, 
the only progressive voices in the state of Arkansas. And you said Grapevine was an underground paper. Is that how it was viewed at the time? Uh, pretty much. That's that was the uh, ar the Argo of the time. Uh, people in uh, other cities would refer to their free weekly newspapers as underground newspapers because they were progressive and they were aimed at a different kind of audi audience than yeah. the uh, the paid daily papers. That's a, that's that's a phrase that's just totally gone out of, of circulation now. Hardly anybody knows what underground paper means. Right, right. Yeah, you don't hear it anymore. Right. So how did you how did you come to be involved with the grapevine? Well, I first started writing for the grapevine off and on back in 1976 and uh, one day as I was walking through the parking lot of what is now the IGA I was approached by one of the four okay. editors at the time and asked if I would be the advertising and business manager and so I agreed and for nine months from uh, August of 77 till March of 78, I was the advertising and business manager until I was made editor after that gentleman finished his PhD at the university and went on to teach in a small college in Mobile, Alabama. So you said there were four editors of Grapevine. Yeah. So what was, I mean, I don't understand what it meant to have four editors. How was Grapevine run at the time? It was uh, anarchic. It was uh, kind of it a It sounds jungle. anarchic, yeah. yeah. You wouldn't know whom you had to report to, who was looking at your material, and who had the final say. In fact, I was told that uh, there were certain nights after the paper had allegedly been finished and put together and was ready to be shipped to the printer, that one of the four editors would decide that uh, something needed to be changed to it, and unbeknownst to the other three, would go in the office and remove some stories and change some things around and uh, it was quite a surprise for the others when they saw the finished product. <laughs> and people didn't come to blows over that? Well, they might have. I wasn't <laughs> around when they did. I was just one of the yeah. uh, satellite writers who would uh, right. come in, drop off their stories, and leave again. I guess that must have... Now, of course, they had four editors, and there was what, like, there were stockholders that owned right. Great by yes. at the time. Uh, originally, the paper was started by a fellow who came to Fayetteville to start a fraternity chapter, and he thought that the uh, Arkansas Traveler, the university paper, right. had a vendetta against the Greeks, and so he decided to start his own Greek paper, and he had worked with a paper in Denver that had been called the Grapevine, and he had a copy of that banner, and so he just pasted it over a uh, page and put some stories on it. And the first issues of the grapevine were all about the fraternity life. Wait, 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 wait. So, so people don't know this. So grapevine started out as a pro-fraternity paper? Correct. And if you'd look at the early issues, you would see columns on who was pinned to whom, what sorority was going to have the biggest party, and what to uh, go to. It was all Greek. That's wonderful. That's just, that's just kind of wonderful in a hideous kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> it was not what the grapevine ended up being no, because no, the no. fellow who started it yeah. ran up some bills he yeah. couldn't pay and left yeah. town in a hurry and I'll left bet. all of this behind him. Yeah. And some people who had been working with him on it before yeah. decided the only way it could support itself was as a uh, profit-making corporation. And so they got some uh, like-minded people together and sold stock to them, including people like Ben Kempel, who is the right. professor of English at the university, and uh, other people who uh, eventually migrated to, to uh, all the, the, the coasts. and They spread a, across the country, and I, as an editor, had to contact these people every year to uh, get them to either come to Fayetteville or send in their proxies for an annual Grapevine Publishing Company meeting that would elect the board of directors. Okay, now now, we're, now you say you as editor. Now, how did you become editor on Grapevine? Uh, about in uh, March of 78, the fellow who was the editor at the time, Doug Howard, right. has, had finished his uh, doctorate in English at the university 
and had gotten a job teaching at a small college in Mobile, Alabama. So he was about to leave, and uh, I applied for the position along with a few other people, and the board of directors of the grapevine decided uh, finally to pick me. And from April of uh, 78 until, no, March of 78 until April of 84, I was the uh, editor of the Great Fund. What was that process like? What did you have to do, submit your writing or a business plan to the well, board Well, I had already published in the Great Fund, so they knew about yeah. my writing. And uh, I just had to meet with them and answer some questions. And, and then through the process of uh, their interviews and their consideration of, of all of the candidates, they finally chose me. So uh, why did they decide to settle on one editor rather than a gaggle of editors as they had before? I think they learned from the experience before that uh, multi-editors -edit do not work. Yeah. You know, you know <clears throat> when I first moved to town in 74, Grapevine was, and that, I think that was the year you moved to Fayetteville too, yes, wasn't it, 74? Yeah. Uh, Grapevine was, because I'd read The Village Voice when I was in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and I, I just loved Grapevine as soon as I moved to Fayetteville. It was one of the things I looked forward to every, every time it came out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So when you became editor, what was it like for you? Well, it was uh, a transition from the business side of the paper to the uh, writing editorial side. Yeah. And I had to uh, find writers, I had to find stories, and then I had to uh, correct them. I had to uh, hire and fire personnel. I had to uh, make sure everything worked in the paper and for the paper and putting it all together. And, and uh, whenever people had ideas or complaints, I was the one who heard them. Yeah. So, uh, so what was that like for you? Uh, That's, it you was, that was probably the hardest part yeah. of the whole situation. And uh, I learned soon that uh, whenever anyone is happy with a story or a situation in life, you never hear from them. That's true. But if they have a complaint, if there is a problem that they perceive you'll be the first one to know oh, about it. Oh, yes. So, so you, you, when, you wrote, when you worked with new writers, um, what was it like? How did you, how'd you seek people out? Did they seek you out? Or? Well, uh, a lot of times we would try to get writers through the writing program in the university or through the journalism de department. Yeah. But the best source of writers eventually was just people coming in off the street who had read the grapevine and had a story idea and thought they could write and they would come in and bring in either a sample of their writing or talk with me and I would give them an, a story idea. And uh, most of the time we could uh, print after some edit editing and alterations just yeah. about whatever was presented to us. So who stands out in your mind from those years as writers? Well, we had uh, some of the best writers, not only in Northwest Arkansas, but in the entire state. The first writer that has to be mentioned is Donald Harrington. Oh, yeah. Who is uh, probably the greatest writer in the history of Arkansas. And he wrote our uh, art reviews from uh, about 79 until 84. Right. And uh, we also had uh, Otto Selassie, who was... Uh, yeah. Uh, a published novelist, and uh, he did a column for us every week, and he also did some sports reporting. And uh, another published author was Tom Cochran, who had a couple of novels published, and he did our sports reporting, and he also did uh, some music stories. And we had uh, Bob Cochran, who uh, was a professor of English at the university, who right. did sports writing. And it's quite amazing to look through those old grapevines and see these people who later achieved prominence. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had Randy Weddington. Yes, Randy was our entertainment editor, which meant that he collected all of the uh, stories about entertainment from record reviews to uh, theater reviews, uh, music reviews, and he would uh, edit them and, uh, and place them in the paper and he also was our movie reviewer, and he had the greatest encyclopedic uh, memory and knowledge of movies of anyone I've ever known. And while while Randy wasn't a wasn't didn't achieve fame as a novelist, Randy 
I think, survived every change in editorship and ownership of the grapevine yes. through, through its closing in 93. Mm -hmm. Yes, Randy was there at the beginning of the grapevine and through my tenure and, yeah. and certainly until then, he was one of the most dedicated people and writers you could always count on Randy. And he didn't actually live in Fayetteville, he lived in the little community of Beaver. Oh really, right up, up, above up by Eureka, Eureka Springs, Springs, yeah. yeah. And he would come down to Fayetteville every uh, Monday when we put the paper together and, and work on the paper. So it was like financially for the paper. I mean, times are hard for alternative papers now as they are for all, all papers. Were times hard financially for the grapevine where you ran it? Yes. The, the, the grapevine depended only on uh, display advertising, which is the advertising with, of borders with yeah. big pictures. And, and uh, we used to get all of our income from the display advertising oh, really? because we didn't charge for the paper. And uh, our display advertising was uh, iffy at best. Uh, it all varied through the seasons. Yeah. Like all business in Fayetteville and probably right. all college towns, it was seasonal and uh, was dependent on the university schedule. So the biggest paper of the year was the back to school issue yeah. right in, in August. And uh, from then it petered on down until the, the Christmas holidays when it would grow again. And then through the winter and into spring, except for a few holidays now and then, it would uh, be a, a vast wasteland. And uh, then it would pick up again in August. So our income was uh, constantly fluctuating and uh, it was not enough simply to get the ads in the paper. We had to get the advertisers to pay. Yeah. And so our accounts receivable were always a problem. Uh, Walmart used to advertise in Grapevine. Correct. Long, I remember that. Well, Walmart used to advertise in Grapevine. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember um, there was this dirty movie theater, a porno oh. theater out in Springdale. Uh, was, just outside yeah. uh, Tri City. That's correct. Yeah. And uh, the reason the reason I remember this is because um, they used to advertise in Northwest Arkansas Times too. Mm -hmm. And uh, Northwest <laughs> Arkansas Times would sort of airbrush the ads, and Grapevine wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Yeah, that was all part of our philosophy. I had a very strict uh, free speech uh, philosophy and policy with the Grapevine. Not only did we not airbrush the Tri-City uh, drive-in porno ads, but we had ads for all kinds of uh, persuasions and ideologies and people. We had classified ads for uh, anti-gays. We had a classified ad one time for the Klan, which caused a whole bunch of controversy. Yeah. But I believe that uh, the uh, exposure of people to all kinds of ideologies and ideas was part of our, our uh, market of ideas here in this country and that it's up to the people to decide what the truth is and what isn't. And for them to see idiocy in its purest and barest form. Is the best, is the best defense, yes. I think, yeah. Um, I think Harry Truman said, you know, freedom of speech means you let the crackpots in, but you know, if, if, if people can't tell when someone's a crackpot, well, you know, they deserve to be taken in. I agree. Uh, you, we talked about some of the writers. What, what kind of stories stand out in your mind from those years? Well, we had uh, one story that uh, a fellow named Mike Barr, who is a earth sciences teacher at yeah. Ramey Junior High, did on the... Uh, Swepco Flint Creek coal-fired power plant in, up in Gentry. And uh, he had uh, found that uh, the, the Swepco had decided in its application to build the plant that the uh, lake that they were going to build to cool the plant was going to be uh, more than sufficient to do the job. But they had been warned by a local geologist that uh, the uh, geology of the Ozarks is so porous with the limestone that the, the lake would never fill up, the, the lake pool would never 
reach the margin that they had planned on. And uh, Mike had uh, done the research, gone over there, and found that indeed that was true, that the lake had never reached the uh, level to which the uh, SWEPCO had uh, planned and had promised. And eventually, Mike went down to the Public Service Commission during its hearing for a SWEPCO rate increase request and presented his information to them. And uh, the uh, result was that eventually the SWEPCO rate increase was cut by a million dollars. So this is definitely a case where an alternative paper had an effect right. on, yeah. on change in Arkansas. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing how much information you can find out with just a few phone calls. And uh, just think if a, a local correspondent would follow the same story and look at the, the uh, current situation of uh, the Flint Creek Lake now and, and the history of the lake, there would be a story in there. And if uh, local reporters would take up the banner of uh, the, the local populace, then I think that they would uh, thrive much more greatly than uh, the uh, papers have been uh, doing today. Yeah. Why do you think that alternative papers traditionally um, do more in-depth stories or do these kind of stories better than daily papers? Well, for one thing, the alternative papers have a different kind of perspective. They're, they're more progressive usually. They're run by younger people, people who, who don't have uh, the income of uh, the wealthy people in the media, and uh, people with interests that are different from your mainstream establishment media. Uh, do you think a lot of it has to do with, I mean, it, it seemed to get a lot of people in town who don't know much about the community too. An alternative newspaper people seem to know more about the community. Mm -hmm. um, do you know that, um, a lot of people don't know this, if you go to the public library and they have all these newspapers on microfilm, there's no, there are no alternative newspapers on microfilm? Really? There are, now if you go to the university library, <coughs> you'll find like the Grapevine mm -hmm. and Ozark right. Gazette, which I worked for, on, on microfilm, but you won't find them in the public library. Mm -hmm. I always felt it was sort of a, a pity that y y there was no uh, sort of grapevine, like collected writings from grapevine in the library, you know, like a book you could just pull down and read the best from grapevine. Right. Yeah, I agree. We have uh, some stories that uh, would certainly make it in any national publication. Yeah. I mean, and, and there's of course, some... with the writers we had, they would would have uh, been able to write for anything you can imagine. And, and unless you're willing to go on to the microfilm, or maybe some people have published their stuff online, mm -hmm. uh, they're pretty much lost, which yeah. is it's sort of sad, you know? Uh, I know that Brian Bolton, who wrote, who wrote for Grapevine, uh, self-published a few of his books. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. A lot of some of those are in the early days, though, and mm -hmm. some of the, the binding on those books wasn't very good. Uh, what about your own writing from those years? What stands out in your mind of your own writing? Well. I interviewed some interesting people from uh, Bill Clinton on his birthday in 1980, the first year that he was governor of Arkansas. He had come up to Fayetteville to celebrate his birthday, and uh, again, Mike Barr and I got him to come into the Grapevine office for an interview. And then I, I interviewed other people from Allen Ginsberg to uh, a Playboy Playmate Centerfold wow. for June of 1982. And um, those personalities and interviews are uh, what uh, come to mind immediately. Yeah. Now, Mike Barkhorst later became editor of Grapevine, and yeah. he became a, a, like yeah. a director of a public access station up, up on the East Coast. Yes, he, he was, uh, uh, for a while, the uh, the manager of Fayetteville Open Channel. That's here, right. And moved to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where he taught video for 18 years in Providence High School. Yeah. And he, he uh, worked with the uh, public access uh, channel in Providence at the time through his job there. 
Yeah, so I mean, he's, he's a pretty interesting guy. Yeah. Uh, you left Grapevine in the, in the, in the mid-80s, mm -hmm. and that's uh, because you had a, a health crisis. Yeah, I, I had a stroke in April of 84 and had to quit the Grapevine, and I had to quit uh, the board of Fayetteville Open Channel. Yeah. Now, now, you were at the university when you had your stroke? Yeah, I, I was listening to a lecture given by uh, counsel from Nicaragua, and uh, I had uh, a right shoulder that started to itch, and I tried to lift my left hand off my knee to scratch it, and I realized I couldn't, and that was the first indication I had that anything was wrong. Wow. And eventually, some friends who were there at the uh, lecture got me to the emergency ward in the hospital, and I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. I was on uh, blood thinners for about three or four months. But I guess you realize at the point you've got to take it easy on a lot of, a lot of things, don't you? Yeah, that's right. I, I had to cut back on a lot, and there were a lot of things I was doing before then that uh, I hadn't, haven't done since. Yeah. Uh, Nicaragua, though, is interesting. Grapevine was the only publication around here to cover Nicaragua to any great extent. Right. And a lot of people around here, they're scratching their heads going, Nicaragua, Nicaragua? Why would Grapevine cover Nicaragua? Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, Nicaragua was, was of great importance to the United States because we were meddling in their affairs so much. Right. There was uh, a leftist government in Nicaragua at the time. Yeah. And uh, the United States was uh, illegally funding some uh, anti-government guerrillas which were called the Contras. And uh, the grapevine was publishing stories about this and about the, the regular people in Nicaragua and who was being affected by the war. And this council was the only Nicaraguan official in the states because we wouldn't allow, or they didn't have an ambassador in the United States. They only had one council. Right. So it's pretty amazing. Just think about those old grapevines, and they alternative papers traditionally are the only ones that cover this kind of thing, so that people can find out this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to grapevine, though, you always you also kept busy in a number of other ways. Um, one organization that's been in the news and uh, kind of unfairly in the news lately <laughs> has been Acorn, mm -hmm. and you were one of the original Arkansas organizers for grape for Acorn, weren't you? Well, I came down to Arkansas in November of 1973 to be an Acorn organizer. Yeah. And uh, ACORN had been started in 69 in Little Rock. Right. And so I was like four years later, and the original founder of ACORN was still there in Little Rock. And I trained in Little Rock for about nine months, and then I was sent up to Fayetteville to take over the office up here. And I've lived, I lived up here and worked for ACORN for a year and a half before I left the organization. Now, now people are going, what, what, Fayetteville? Fayetteville had an ACORN office, you know? So where was the Fayetteville ACORN office? It was at uh, 10 East Rock Street, just off the square, and I believe it's, it's uh, a vacant lot there now. So that's not so far from here? No, it's right down the street from the, the CAT office. So that's right, we're at 101 West Rock, so that's just like, uh, just up that way, Correct. right? Okay. Yeah, it was, it was an old wood-framed house, right. and uh, the office was in the downstairs area, and my living quarters were upstairs in the bedroom. Was it a big yellow house? or? It was a white house. Okay. I remember that house. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, that got torn down years ago. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so what did, a what did ACORN concern itself with? What were the kinds of things that, that you did with ACORN? Well, we were uh, an organization that worked with poor and working class people to help improve their neighborhoods. Here in, in Northwest Arkansas, I was working with some people in Rogers to get uh, running water and sewer in their neighborhood. And I was working with some people outside of uh, Avoca to uh, get a, a, a waste uh, landfill to abide by the uh, the uh, PC and E pollution control and ecology regulations and uh, some other groups in Springdale to improve their neighborhoods get better drainage street lights stop signs and and then on larger scales these groups could join together for uh, more important issues things like utility rate reform right. and tax reform, better schools. 
and, and ACORN also organizes people in, in voted, voting registry drives, but that's just a, a mm -hmm. small portion of what they do, isn't it? That's correct, yeah. <clears throat> and it's to use that awful, they empower people. They empower people who are, mm -hmm. who are <clears throat> um, live below the poverty line, basically. I think that's why they're a target, I think, of, of so many people on the right wing. Yeah, well, I think of it as a, a sign of their success that ACORN is being targeted by anyone and that to the extent that they had made these people angry, it's a commendation and recommendation of the efficiency and the effectiveness that they have had. Because if you had never heard of ACORN, they would not have been doing very much. I, I think, uh, I, I engage a lot of right-wingers about ACORN. And I say, what do they do? And then they, they go to this litany about how Acorn lies and cheats and steals from the government. It's obvious that they don't want, they don't know anything about Acorn, nor do they actually want to know anything about like Acorn. They just want to know the cliches and the and the and the, the mistruths that are spread about by people. So they don't yeah. really want to know too much about Acorn. They, I know it makes them uncomfortable. I think because Acorn is empowering the wrong sort of people. Mm -hmm. That's right. So were there two offices? Were there two Acorn offices in Fayetteville? Or just one? Uh, there was just the, the one office on Rock Street in Fayetteville. And I think in the state itself we had offices in Little Rock, North Little Rock, Pine Bluff, Jonesboro, Fort Smith, and Fayetteville. That's pretty amazing. You know, actually, Acorn doesn't seem to be that active in Arkansas anymore, as, I, as active as it once was. I don't think they moved their uh, headquarters from Little Rock down to New Orleans yeah. back in the 80s. And I think New Orleans is now much more, and Louisiana, much more uh, active. And ACORN uh, just outgrew itself. It, it spread so fast it ran out of organizers. Yeah. Unfortunately, now with so many people joining the ranks of the poor, uh, there'll be probably a lot of work for ACORN for mm -hmm. years to come. That's right. Yeah, bad times are... Uh, so did your work with ACORN overlap your work with Grapevine, or did you stop... No, I, I finished my work with uh, Acorn in uh, 1975. Yeah. And so uh, it was just two years later <clears throat> that I started to work with the grapevine. Was that a satisfying sort of work for you when you worked for Acorn? It was the most rewarding and the most demanding work I've really? ever done. Why was, it, why, was, why was it the most demanding? Well, working with people is never easy, yeah. and to work with people who have no power and to try and convince them that they could have power and that they could yeah. change things in their lives, that is the most challenging thing I can imagine. Power, it, it, it seems to be that, that when, when people are in that stage, it's, it's like it's power is stripped from them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's true today, too, and they don't seem to know, they don't seem to realize they have any power in their lives, and they seem to believe that it's their role in life to be stepped on. Mm -hmm. Is that, was that right. true then, yeah. too? Well, th that's been their life's experience yeah. all the years that they lived, that all the years that their parents had lived, their ancestors and forefathers had lived. Yeah. They'd been oppressed and, and crushed and beaten down, exploited, and extracted. So uh, did you have to go seek them out, or did they come to the Acorn office, or how did this work? Well, a lot of times we would get a call from a, a neighborhood or individual in the neighborhood who uh, had a problem that they thought that ACORN could help them with. Yeah. And then we would go into the neighborhood and with this person go around and talk with the neighbors and see who was interested in getting together and organizing an ACORN group. And we would have meetings to organize the group and we'd have meetings to decide on strategies and whom to contact, and we would meet with public officials and do whatever needed to be done to get the problems fixed in that community. Okay. Even though you left ACORN in 75, uh, did the office close when you left ACORN, or did it stay, on, did it stay open? No, or? there were still some organizers who came up to the office. There were a couple of organizers after me. Finally, uh, the uh, organization expanded so much that yeah. they started taking organizers out of uh, established cities in Arkansas and putting them in places like St. Louis or uh, yeah. even South Dakota. So did Grapevine ever do any stories about Grapevine, about Acorn, or do you, as you recall when you were there? Or? I don't believe we did. In fact, I tried to remain 
fairly neutral about that. Yeah. I didn't want to uh, inject myself and my past political experience into uh, the, the uh, editorial positions of the paper. Right. Speaking of editorial positions, mm -hmm. uh, one thing, and uh, <clears throat> when I was editor of a newspaper, uh, I always enjoyed writing editorials. What was it like for you when you did? It, was this something you enjoyed? It was a great way to vent my feelings and frustration. Yeah. You know? it's, it's the same thing, I'm sure, for letter writers to uh, editors of newspapers. Uh, except with the editorial, you know that you're going to be the last say in, in, in the uh, publication of right. it. Right, yeah. What about feedback from Grapevine when you were there? Did, what was the public response to Grapevine when you were there? The public uh, was uh, mostly supportive. Again, if anything PO'd the readers or bothered them for any reason, they would contact us. Yeah. But mostly people felt a very close connection to the Grapevine like it was their paper. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's, we talk about the ownership society, and it's not. And people, I, I think, they feel like they own alternative papers because right. it's, it's like their paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in 1980, uh, or maybe previous 1980, you became involved with something else too. You became involved in public access in Vago. Yes. Right. I was one of the first. Well, there were about uh, 12 or so of us on the first. Fayetteville Open Channel Board of Directors, which was the first public access TV station here in Fayetteville. Now, where would that meeting take place? It was in the Ozarks Electric Community Room down okay. on uh, Highway. Is it out near Weddington? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, what was it? What was it like then? Because uh, you know, public access is nearing its 30th anniversary in 2010, right? Uh, what was it like in the in the in the wild and woolly days in, in uh, so many years ago? Yeah. It was very primitive. We had to uh, beg and borrow a lot of the equipment, and uh, whenever it broke, we had to try and fix it ourselves. Yeah. It, it was uh, the dark ages of television. I remember you, you had to, there was a there was a small studio on Dixon Street, right. where Amelia's Restaurant is now. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I think people who go to the restaurant now probably can't imagine there was a TV studio in there. Mm -hmm. In fact, I took my original uh, video training in that studio years ago, in 1984. Um, uh, there used to be a thing called short takes, which was, no, they would take fives, I think, in those days, and they were like short takes now where everybody can, in the community can come on and do a song or dance or speak about anything they want to. Mm -hmm. And you did a kind of humorous one, didn't you? Because uh, I think a preacher did one. Yes, uh, I, I was provoked into doing uh, a take five by uh, a lecture that was shown on uh, Fayetteville Open Channel by uh, a minister trying to convince young ladies to retain their chastity. And so I thought that the opposite view should be presented. And I came on with a sermon on lust. And uh, unfortunately, I hear that that uh, tape is no longer around. No, sorry, I believe that tape's no longer around, which is too bad because really, I think any sermon on lust should be played as often as possible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, what, what was it like? I think mean, the early days of the program. What, what was the programming like in the early days? I guess was it all just produced by the community? Uh, yes, it was all from the local people. We had uh, people like Peter Harkins who had a call-in TV. That was show. a wonderful show. A lot of people were inspired by Peter Harkins' mm -hmm. show. Yeah. Yeah, and he also had a show where he would be driven around or drive around the back roads of northwest Arkansas and really? talk about the history of the area. And that was a fascinating now, show. Now that's pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. It's a shame that that show's lost. Yeah. Um, I know it, it was just, I think public access is always fascinating. It's sort of fascinating in a sad kind of way when you hear about these shows that are lost and you won't, you won't see anymore. Um, how closely connected was Grapevine to Fate Open Channel in those days? Was well, there? the grapevine actually was part of a lawsuit against Fayetteville Open Channel. At one point, yeah. the board of directors of Fayetteville Open Channel had to fire our uh, director, our manager of the station, and she was the wife of uh, 
a member of the board, which was a, a bad situation to get into and an education for all of us. And so that the board member eventually sued Fayetteville Open Channel and sued the grapevine because the grapevine had published a letter to the editor from some open channel producers who were not happy with the management. Oh. I remember, you know, after Fate Open Channel disintegrated in the early 90s, I, a box of uh, files came in my possession. I read a bunch of these letters back and forth, and it was, mm -hmm. it was interesting. Now that makes sense to me, you know, because I wasn't aware of that at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess it, it was, those were the wild and woolly days of access. Now things have changed, but they're still pretty much the same, even though the, the equipment's changed. Well, I hope that things have calmed down a lot more. Things still get exciting every so often. Still, things things still get exciting every so often. But uh, I think I think as ever, excess always retains its ties to the community. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the state of alternative media in the United States today? Well, I think that alternative media is about the only trustable, verifiable media that we have today. Corporate media, unfortunately, does not have the commitment to. Uh, to stories and the news and to digging out the facts and the truth about information. Yeah. And in fact, uh, the corporate media around here is about to combine into uh, one massive paper. Right, if, 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 the, if the merger goes through. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And here are two corporations, each of which are some of the wealthiest individuals and corporations in the state of Arkansas who cannot fund their own individual enterprise. So they eliminate competition so that uh, they can find a few more pennies. And, and nobody benefit, really, I mean, they might benefit from that, but readers don't benefit from that. No, no, the, the less competition anywhere in any aspect of this economy is bad for the consumer, yeah. and ultimately, it's bad for the uh, business people yeah. too. Yeah. You know, the free market is based upon competition, and whenever you eliminate competition anywhere, right, the free market suffers, businesses suffer, and the consumers suffer. Exactly, and especially I think we're at a point in our country now we just can't afford to have less information or less unfettered mm -hmm. information. Uh, speaking of unfettered information, where do you, where do you get your information from? Where, where do you, what do you read? Where do you get your information? Uh, I read occasionally the, uh, the newspapers in the libraries that I pick up. I, I read everything from the local papers, the, the Times, the Northwest Arkansas, the Morning News of Northwest Arkansas, the, the Democrat, and I read the uh, Wall Street Journal once in a while. But those are my, probably my main sources. Yeah. What about radio? Do you listen to anything on the radio? or? I listen to uh, KUF most of the time. I also listen to KXUA. They don't have much in the way of news. That's a student-run yes. station at the, at the, at the, at the university, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you, never did, you never did anything on the radio, did you? No. So I, you, I you were a triple did. threat, but you weren't a quadruple <laughs> threat. No. Yeah. I was smart enough to stay out of radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ever think you'll do anything on, on TV again or ever, ever do stuff with... I mean, do you ever think you'll branch out again or...? or? No, right now I'm pretty involved in uh, writing a book. And uh, really? That occupies most of my time. So what are you writing? It's on the social meaning of skin complexion fashion. Really? You did a... Um, I remember this now. I'm glad you brought this up because I, I forgot about this. You wrote an article about skin cancer for Grapevine about 20 right. years ago that yes. I read. Yeah. Uh-huh. So is your, is your book along those lines, or is it different, or what? Well, that, that's uh, 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 an aspect of it, but mainly it's on the notion that 100 years ago, people wanted to be pale because if you were pale, it meant that you worked and lived indoors and you were therefore rich. Really? Because the people who had the tans and sunburns were the peasants who had to work out in the fields. Oh. So our skin complexion was an indication of our social class, and that's true today despite the fact that fashions have reversed and people want to have a suntan instead of pale skin, but that's because a suntan today has the same subtextual message as a 
pale skin before that you had money and leisure time. Right. So now people, now people, of course, now people go to the tanning booth. Correct. Mm -hmm. End up looking like shoe leather. Yeah. So um, that's pretty fascinating, though. You're right. So, so how far along are you, are you on your book? That's pretty fascinating idea. Well, I would say I'm probably about half done. That's pretty fascinating. Um, do, you ever, do you ever think you'll write uh, articles for publication again, or is the book just a full-time job? I think I'm going to be just uh, a book writer from now on. That's pretty, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. Um, before we go, are there, is there any particular stories from Grapevine or anywhere you'd like to share with us? Now, there's one story I, I need to share. Okay. Back in uh, the early 80s, besides working on the Grapevine and being involved with Fairful Open Channel, I would also get up once in a while and sing some songs with the Mike Sumler band. And uh, the, the band had a lead guitarist by the name of John Anderson. And yeah. John had a music business, which he would, he would provide the sound for bands and bars and concert venues. Yeah. And once in a while, I would help him with it. And uh, in the summer of 1983, he had a gig up at Lake Leatherwood in Eureka Springs. And uh, I helped him up there. It was a fundraiser with a bunch of bands. And after the end of the concert, the, the, the bands all left the stage, and John and I got up, and I was singing, and John was playing. And all of a sudden, to my right, this saxophone had started blaring away and just blew my mind. I looked over there, and there's this stubby little guy just blowing the bleep out of saxophone. And eventually, I learned this guy's name was Jeffrey Barnes. And two months later, Lee Tambulian, who is another local musician, right. came yeah. into my office in the grapevine and said, hey, Jeff Barnes just got a job gigging with a band from Denton, Texas called Brave Combo. Oh, and by the way, they're going to be here in Faithful in two weeks. Oh, and by the way, here's a magazine with a story about them. So I wrote a story about Jeff Barnes and Brave Combo, and I began the story with the best lead I have ever written in my life. It said, the first time I saw Jeff Barnes, he blew his brains out. <laughs> That's a pretty good lead. Uh, you, you could almost retire after that. Yeah. All I'll right. never write a better one. You'll never write a better one. That's not a good reason to stop writing, but that's a, good, that's a great lead. All right. Well, Peter, I want to thank you very much for being on the show today. Well, thank you, Richard. All right. Thank fun. you. All right. Thank you all for watching, and uh, that's the... Thanks anyway, thank you all for watching and we'll see you next week. I'm Dan Robinson, Executive Director of Your Media. I'm Public Access Television, and so are you. Look at me. Hey. Raymond, look at Mommy. Maybe the light hurts his eyes. Maybe she's just not hungry. Maybe he can't hear us. Maybe we're not stimulating him enough. Maybe it's a phase. Avoiding eye contact is one early sign of autism. Learn the others today. The sooner it's diagnosed, the better. You turn on the television or you pick up a newspaper magazine and all the information you see is just controlled by a handful of corporations. So how are you or I or any of us? How can we get our messages out to people? How can you tell people what you care about? You can go on Facebook and compete with uh, hundreds of people who post things that may or may or may not be true. You can go on Twitter 
and post things in a, with a handful of characters, because Twitter is really the place for literate people to hang out. Or you could go in with a sandwich board and walk the streets. You could write a letter to the editor. Or, even better, you could go to public access television. Public access serves your community on a first come, first serve basis. And whether you're rich or poor, doesn't matter. It's first come, first served. Everyone in the community is welcome to come to public access and talk about not only the issues that are important to them, but if you have a, a poem to recite, a story to tell, a song to sing, just anything at all that's in your mind or heart to tell, you come to public access. Public access in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm speaking right now, has been around since 1980, and I've seen it change events in Fayetteville. And uh, the nice thing about public access now in the 21st century is that it's not just on a television channel, but it's also on the internet, so you can reach people around the world. So if you're just, if you feel frustrated at not being able to talk to people, not being able to get your message out, and you think there's no way to do it, well, take heart, there is. Public access, it's a vital component of our First Amendment rights. So public access, like the man says, use it or lose it. October is the month to, um, for us to all think about domestic violence. And in Kansas City, there's been a number of things going on. We participated in a Take Back the Night march. Um, at all of these events, and if you go to the legislature, if you look in the newspaper, the way we deal with a lot of the domestic violence in, when we talk about it is by looking at statistics. And I want to share just a few statistics with you, even though many of you have probably already heard most of them. Um, every 15 seconds, a woman battered in this country. 60% um, of all the young boys that grow up in violent homes and hate their father for what he does will eventually grow up and become their father. 50% of all young girls growing up in violent homes will become adult victims. Um, there are many, many statistics, and I think statistics are a powerful way of reminding ourselves how prevalent it is, that um, certainly we're not alone. Um, but they're also a little bit dangerous when people rely on them um, to talk about it, because in some ways you can use numbers to forget who's really being affected. A woman from Lawrence, Kansas, named Rachel Miller wrote this next song, it's called Mathematics, and it looks at the phenomenon of using statistics in such a way. <coughs>
Is a hard way.